morning. You coming in then? Good morning, and what a show we've got lined up for you today. Today's going to be a special one, because we'll be joined in the house throughout the morning by the award-winning singer, songwriter and record producer, Example will be here. <laughs> Everybody excited about that one. And I'll be swapping my mini for a vintage steamboat as I embark on a culinary cruise around the Lake District in this week's little food adventure. The wonderful Romy Gill will be here as well. Uh, she'll be taking over the kitchen duties a little bit later, and I'll be investigating the phenomenon of a food truck with a little help from Elizabeth Brown. And if that wasn't enough, then I'll be joined all morning by a top chef who's been a mate of mine since the Ready Steady Cook days. That was a long time ago. It's Mr Paul Rankin, he's here! Good morning! <laughs> Good to see you, fella. How nice you? to be here. I feel like I'm on my holidays. You've yeah, yeah, well, it's sardines are right your street, aren't we? are going to talk about it in a minute, but... Yeah, I mean, when I head off to France, Spain, Portugal, Greece, almost the first thing I want is a yeah. plate of freshly cooked sardines. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about those as well, because I thought, uh, now, with this week, it's Sustainable Fish Week to celebrate. We're going to kick things off with uh, two wonderful dishes. Uh, with one of the most sustainable fish in our seas, particularly around the seas of Cornwall, and that's Cornish sardines. Uh, and these are absolutely delicious. So I'm going to do these sort of two ways, really. Uh, I'm going to do these, some of which we're going to get in can, we'll talk about in a minute. I'm going to do one viage and one with classic sort of Spanish-style tomatoes. You know that grilled bread that you get with the tomatoes? Uh, yeah, you know the one that everybody, uh, everybody loves. It's so simple to do as well. But you it's take... such a classic Spanish thing, and I, I must... I imagine when, when, say, my mum or my grandparents would have first saw that, they would have thought, why don't they just slice the tomatoes and, like we do and have, like, a tomatoes on toast? <laughs> They're squishing it and ruining all the tomatoes. It's not the same, is it? But it's, it's really special. It, it is, uh, and it's so, so simple, particularly this time of year as we get, mm. you know, the sardines are in season, but you've still got fresh tomatoes in season there as well. It's wonderful. Mm. And you take these and just grate them, like you said. And I know you travel a lot all over the world, but you, you can appreciate the great quality of seasonality fish and se seasonal dishes like this. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the great joys of travelling is seeing and tasting authentic food in another place. Yeah. Well, you talked about travelling all over the world, but hopefully, uh, by the power of the internet, we can go live down to Benzance to speak to Nick Howell from the Pilchard Works to find out more about this incredible fish that I'm going to be using today. So I can see you there, Nick. How are you? Lovely, yeah. Well, okay. welcome to the show as well. Now, tell us, tell us about your life, first of all, before you ended up down in, down in Cornwall. You started out uh, working in the, the, the newspaper industry, didn't you? Yeah, I used to work in uh, Thompson Regional Newspapers in London on the Newcastle Journal and the Scotsman, purely as a, a junior advertising rep, prodding the streets, selling advertising space. And then you end up moving down to Cornwall, deciding to go down the fishing route, uh, but entrepreneurship, yeah. you ended up... Didn't you end up selling sort of Me Megrim Soul to the Spanish? That's how it all started? Before the Pilchard Works, that's yeah, how it all started? So one of those funny moments where uh, you're looking at species of fish, because, as you know, uh, different countries have different opinions on fish. Like, the Scots prefer haddock to cod. Uh, we don't like some flat fish. The Spanish prefer uh, megrims, and the Scottish didn't like them. But th they were making so much money in Spain, I thought I'd better start selling them out there. Love it. So we built a new factory, put in uh, grading machines, which no one had ever heard of and started exporting hake and megrooms to Spain. And then very, very quickly, you end up... With, what? In, so that was in the sort of mid-70s. You then go from there to to, to having the, the factory that you've got now, and you ended up buying buying this cannery. Tell, tell us about the cannery and the history side of it. I'm just going to... By the way, where we did do that, I've got some grated tomatoes which I've got in here, the juice I've got into there, but this is when we mix it with a bit of garlic and olive oil, salt and pepper, and that's that one done. But tell us, tell us how it all started and why you ended up buying it. OK, it wasn't, it, we had Shippens down here as a cannery, and this was not their cannery. This was their salted pilchard business, which I'd never heard of. Um, salted pilchards were, have been exported to Italy from Cornwall since 1555. And, and when I looked at this factory, it was totally the wrong business reason for buying it, because it had one customer and one product. But it had last been modernised in 1925, and I thought it just a complete heart overhead. I loved the old equipment in there, the wooden barrels, the wooden boxes. So just leapt in and bought it and as, a, as an extra business to the fresh fish business. And salted, salted pilchards are whole head-on, gut in, salted for about six months, 
and then pressed into wooden barrels and boxes. And these were going to Italy or and being distributed around the mountains on those little mobile vans and all the back streets, um, alimentari. So very different to fresh pilchards. So, so tell me, I've got these amazing Cornish <coughs> sardines, which it all starts off, and particularly your product starts off with these. What makes it so special? What 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 makes these so highly prized now? Because the the, the increase in fishing over the years. I mean, back in the you know late nineties, we used to sort of catch you know sort of single figure tons a, a year. Now it's thousands of tons a year in in Cornwall. What what makes these so special? Um. They're obviously the freshness, fantastic. We're literally catching in Mounts Bay, a couple of miles off the coast of Newlyn. But but back then, we were struggling to get enough uh, pilchards. We needed about 100 to 120 tonnes a year, and I was having to buy them from big boats landing mackerel in, in Plymouth. And uh, then trying to diversify this very single product, single customer business into selling fresh pilchards, none of the supermarkets were interested. And it was one of those light bulb moments. The, the species scientific name for a pilchard is Sardina pilchada. And you could either call it a sardine or a pilchard. Yeah. And the image, image that most people have of pilchard was tins and a horrible sludgy tomato sauce. Yeah. And when you said, when you asked someone, what do you think of a sardine? They would say, oh, Portugal, Spain, barbecues on the beach, etc. Oh, right, we'll call it a Cornish sardine. And the publicity was amazing. Every and, and national just, newspaper. Just for changing one word, just for changing the name into from Pilchard to Sardines. Yeah, yeah. Then registered it with Europe, uh, gave the name to the Cornish Sardine Management Association, and the landings have gone from seven tonnes a year, those single figures you mentioned, up to some years we're now 6,000 tonnes. Wow. That's amazing, isn't it, really? So I've got, I've got my sardines cooking over there. I've got some bread. All I'm going to do, really, is take, take this bread, and I'm just going to... Start off with, with taking a little bit of garlic over this, um, over this. So just rub it with a bit of garlic over the top. And then for this one, I thought I'd use yours first uh, and use these amazing ones out of a can. So what we're going to do is just take the tomatoes, which you can just... This has got salt and pepper. It's just the pulp of the tomatoes. Nothing else. Just pop that over the top. And then, of course, I've got yours in the cans. Now... These I'm using the ones with just olive oil in. We've got the ones in the tomato sauce over here. This is a, it's an amazing story how you go from getting what the factory that you are now to now you're actually canning these in Brittany, aren't you, as well? Yes. The, the, um, when I started looking, it was, it was one of those visits in, um, uh, to a cannery, my wife's Brethel, and uh, in 2000. And uh, uh, the, the boss of this uh, very ancient cannery took us out for dinner and when he opened this can of sardines for us at dinner, uh, I, I was just amazed at the taste and asked how we produce. There's two ways of producing tins of uh, sardines. One we call the industrial method, one the artisan method. The artisan method takes a lot more preparation. Uh, it's cooked by hand, it's put in the tins by hand, basically cooked before canning. The industrial way, it all goes in raw, you boil it in the tin. And the flavour is so, massively, massively different because of that, isn't it, really? That's the key to this. Well, I'm glad you noticed, yeah, because that's the biggest replies that we have back from people, is, gosh, didn't know sardines or pilchers could taste like this. Mm. So, yes, you're quite right, and it does make a difference, which is obviously why they're slightly more expensive, but nowadays, um, it's taste that we're all on. These sardines are obviously seasonal. They come in particularly this time of year. Give us a give us an idea of when people should look out for them, really, because uh, you can see them in in Cornwall coming in big shoals, followed by dolphins and and chasing after the shoals of these amazing sardines. So when's the season really that you've got down there? As the water warms up, the the water now is twenty degrees, and and so, uh, sardines, pilchards, mackerel, they're all plankton feeders. So as the water warms up. The phytoplankton and zoo and zooplankton expand up the Bay of Biscay all round Cornwall, and the sardines follow them, and they come in usually about the second third week of July, and they'll be here until uh, end of January, beginning of February, and you're talking about uh, the Cornish stock is between four hundred and five hundred thousand tons, so us taking six thousand tons is amazingly sustainable. Before you go, boss, yeah. before you go, I've spotted behind your shoulder 
I can see a car. <laughs> now, I can, yes, I can see really? one. Yes. Is that, what is no. that? It's, that looks like a Saab behind you. That's a little Saab, yeah, 1958 two stroke. I just love the sound of those two stroke engines. I love it. And, Absolutely. And of course, love it. You, you, you like rally cars, and you remember how Eric Carlson flattened everybody with his little 850cc Saab in the, in the uh, Monte Carlo rally. Yeah, exactly. Well, they'd stop making Saabs now anymore, but they're still doing these amazing pilchers. So best of luck with everything you're doing as well. Uh, like you say, uh, I think people will love these because they taste totally, totally different to the, to the stuff fantastic that you brought product. up as a kid. They're, they're fantastic. And it's a great story. Thanks for coming on the show as well. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Jay. Thank you. Bye. Take care. How amazing was that? But there you have it. Some beautiful sort of sardines, we're going to call them. Not pilchers anymore, but we've got sardines. Uh, either fresh like this on toast. Uh, we've got lovely crispy sardines over here, or we've just got some classic ones with a little viage. Either way, they all taste fantastic. Bon appétit. <laughs>
to the present day. Hi. Hi, welcome Rachel, to the museum. Claire. Hi. Nice. So tell me about this place, because this is, this is almost brand new. Yeah, so this is Windermere Jetty, uh, Museum of Boats, Steam and Stories, and we're standing in our new buildings, which have only been open a few months now. It's a brilliant place to learn about 200 years of boating history on Windermere. Um, right. You're going to see a whole range of boats, everything from Beatrix Potter's Tarn boat through to the beautiful steam launch like Branksome behind us and modern hydroplanes that you can see as well. These are the race boats behind us? Yeah, absolutely. So Windermere has a really long history of speed trials and innovation here as well. These are slightly more modern boats dating from around the 60s through to the 80s. So, Claire, I've organised them to take this, off, this one off the wall, if that's all right. You can have a go in that. Well, it looks a little bit scary for me. You'll be all right then. <laughs> yeah. And it's even more scary when you realise that you actually be driving that on your belly, face first, as you speed down the lake at nearly 200 kilometres an hour. Wow. Yeah, we've got something a little bit more reserved. But... We're taking a trip out onto the lake on board Osprey, a fully restored Edwardian steam launch. There's no better way to bring the boating history of the Lake District to life. Well, except perhaps to do it on a sunny day. So while Claire takes shelter on board, I chat with skipper Ian Shearer. So, skipper, I don't think they built these for, for the driver to be comfortable, did they? They're more like... No, no, <laughs> if, if this was your boat, you'd be in there if it was raining, or there's another wheel at the front, right. and you just have a little steer behind your back. And that's it. But when it gets to something tricky, you see, you take over in case it crashes. So, so this, is the, this is the same technology of a steam train? It is, yes. It's just it's just turning the a prop round rather than turning wheels yeah. round. So. so the water, I'm so. taking. Are you using the water from the lake? Yeah, this is a this is a gauge glass. We've got water in here with these two valves here. Yeah. We can turn them on, sucks water straight from the lake, tops it up, and, uh, and away we go. So what's the top speed? Um, if we open to full steam, yeah. we get to the heady heights of about ten miles an hour. Is that what it is? <laughs> Uh, you don't want to be going any these, quicker, though, the, here, do you? These were, these were built for luxury. Yeah. yeah. Built for just cruising around and enjoying the lakes. It needs adapting, though, for a roof on this bit. Just just a little one over me, yes. please. <laughs> <laughs> that is fabulous. Yeah. You might not get anywhere quickly, but at least that allows plenty of time for us to get warm and dry inside and hope that that rain stops before my final cook of the day. Right, before I do anything, Ash, just take a picture of that. That's the first bit of blue sky I've seen since I've been here. 47 years I've been coming to the Lake District, and that is a first. So this is actually a first. We're going to do um, a goose and a chicken with some nice little orange lentils. Really simple. I'm going to explain the chicken a little bit later, but first thing, before we do anything, we need to get our onions in. So this is quite a simple little dish, but it requires plenty of onions at its base. A lot of Indian cooking requires a lot of onions. I've got a mate of mine who's got a restaurant in London. He's got four chefs just preparing onions. That's it, all day. Just preparing onions the whole day. But the first thing we can do is grab a little bit of oil in our pan. I don't use olive oil for this, just a normal sort of veg oil. Throw the onions in, in there. But we just want a nice little bit of colour on the onions first of all. So once you get to that stage, you can add a few curry leaves to this as well. You can get these fresh or dried. A bit of ginger, you can use this puree ginger. And then just a touch of puree garlic as well. A few mustard seeds, they're going in. You just have to toast this off a little bit. Just colour the onions like that, so just get it all cooking away nicely. Now while that's happening, we can turn our attention to our spices. And I've got in here a selection. I've got some cumin, garam masala, I've got some chilli, turmeric, some coriander. Really, these are the key five ones that you want. And then just grab a little teaspoon and take a little bit of each one. Now, particularly when you're using dried spices like this, the temptation is to add them to the pan. The problem is with that, they can burn quite badly. And you get this distinct flavour to the end product. But by mixing them together beforehand, with a bit of water, it stops them from burning. So you just took a little bit of water, like that, and mix this together. But you pop our lentils straight in. And then we add our spice mix straight in. A little bit of water. Now, what I'd normally do with this is just gradually cook it for about 20 minutes, but the power of TV and all, we 
pass it on to the amazing woman, which is Sam Head. She goes wandering into a house, which is just over there, and continues to cook them. Meanwhile, I'm going to turn my attention to my goose and a chicken, which I've got here. Now, there's several things that are famous around these parts. There's goose and a cake, which is like a, a shortcake, really, um, with caraway seeds on it. With the, they serve with cheese. Uh, there's goose and a duck, but also famous around these parts is goose and a chicken. It's slightly south of the Lake District, for sure, but this is an amazing chicken. You can see from the size of it that it's slightly larger because they take it on a little bit further. It's not like a traditional farm chicken, but what it is is fantastic flavour. And I'm going to basically portion this chicken up to go on our barbie. So what you do is remove the legs first of all. Now, because this is corn-fed and a secret recipe of corn-fed, the corn feed is made with the help of a nutritionist. It's that good, that attention to detail. You don't get this yellow tinge that is classic with a corn-fed chicken. This, you get a beautiful flavour from it. And you can see from the chicken, it's much larger. We used to do this when we were at college. It's called cut for saute, or in terms of today, cut for the barbecue. But once you master this art, you can do this with all game birds as well. Quail, pheasant, partridge, that kind of stuff. So we're going to take some pieces of lemon, like that. Bit of garlic, straight through. And I'm basically just going to cook it on one of these things. And we just pop our chicken in. A bit of lemon, a bit of garlic. Fall this over. A little bit of oil, just a touch, black pepper, and a bit of salt. It's all about the flavour of the chicken. You could marinate this in the same spices I've got in here if you wanted to. A little bit of yoghurt, turn it much more sort of a curry Indian sort of thing. But I thought this with just the lentils is probably just enough. So all I'm going to do is pop that on there and do a rain dance because it's on its way. I wouldn't mind, but they don't even give me a drink. You know what I mean? At least having a beer. There we go, nout. Nothing. I guess it could be worse. All right. 18 years food team. <laughs> One team, one dream, isn't it, Sam? One team, one dream. <laughs> Stupid idea this is. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Lovely. Somebody all that? Thank you. Right, we've got our lentils. Now, the key to all lentils, really, in fact, all beans and that kind of stuff, season it at the end of cooking. Don't season it at the beginning, otherwise they toughen up. So, a bit of black pepper, a bit of salt, and then to compensate from the spice, really, you want the lemon. So, a nice squeeze of lemon. Look, I'll tell you what, that chicken looks pretty good. Look at that! Look at that! I'm quite happy with that. So, we've got our herbs here. We've got some coriander and a bit of mint. And the thing about coriander and mint, particularly coriander, utilise everything, stalks the lot. That's going to go in here last minute. Now, if you want to slake this down, you could touch a cream, bit of yoghurt. But what I like to do with my lentils is a little knob of butter. Just nicely enriches the flavour in there. So mix that all together. While that's on there, just simmer it away nicely. We'll get our serving tray. Let me pop our chicken open. Just a little bit of herbage over the top. So we'll take our chicken off with our lemon. Bits of garlic, everything else. Bit of oil. And then we've got our lentils. Our spiced little lentils. And that butter makes all the difference, trust me. And saying that butter makes all the difference, you have to serve it like you serve it with mash with another bit of butter on the top. So there you have it, barbecue chicken, goose and a chicken with curry lentils. Where's that umbrella? Let's face it, it wouldn't be a proper British barbecue if there wasn't some rain. But when the food is this good, 
not burnt. Trust me, you won't care about the weather. Still to come, we've got dishes all the way from Paul Rankin and Romy Gill, and I'll be finding out what it takes to run a successful food truck. We're going to have a food truck here for the very, very first time on the show, and I'm getting all the information I need from its owner, Elizabeth Brown. But I'll see you back here in a couple of minutes when I'll be making steak, chips and Bernay sauce for one of the hottest names in British music. I'll see you in a minute. I need to get my glow sticks. Welcome back. Now, coming up, we've got a masterclass in seasonal fish, and Chef Paul Rankin and Romy Gill will be uh, testing out some recipes of their very own a little bit later. But first, I'm here with a carna, a food lover, just happens to be one of the biggest names in the British dance music scene. Put your hands together for an example! <laughs> Elliot, 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 good to... Ching, ching, yeah, ching, ching, ching. Great to see you at the house. Mate, thanks for having me, because finally. Because it's, it's nearly a... Well, finally, we've been trying to get you on for about a decade. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I, did, I moved to Australia, though, shortly after we you, met. You did, and you're a bit busy as well at, your, at the moment. Yeah, I've done uh, 33 gigs this summer. And uh, now... like, it's like the glory years of, like, 2012, 2013, and um, I'm back. It's unbelievable. We, we, I know you're a big food lover, so I was trying to wrap my brains thinking, what am I going to cook you? So I do steak chip bernays, do what chefs love to eat. Is that oh, yeah, right? Exactly, yeah. Just to start with. So we'll if, do... if, I was, uh, if I was ever on death row and I was going to my last meal, it would probably be a steak frit. So... Steak frit, that's what you're going to be having then. Uh, so tell us about these festivals then, because don't you still hold the record for the most amount of festivals in one year? Does that still... I, I don't know if it's a record, but... I, uh, in 2015, I did 128 gigs. Uh, I would have actually done 15 more, but my Achilles packed up. But I don't know what if whether that's a record or not. Sheeran's yeah. probably got the record now, but I think that year, I was the only artist apart from Rihanna to play two arena tours in the UK in the same 12 months. Well, you mentioned she uh, Ed Sheeran's got the record now. You're both mates, aren't you? Well, yeah, Ed's actually his... Uh, I mean, he's been gigging since he was 12. He's a nutter. You should get a train and go sleep on you know, people's pub floors just yeah. to play four songs. But um, I, when, to put it in perspective, when I met him, Twitter was a big thing. Yeah. Like, you know, Twitter had just started. I had 90,000 followers, he had 6,000 followers, and I invited him to come support me on tour. And he ended up doing probably about 30 gigs as my support act. So, we, yeah, we go way back. But you go, you go way back in terms of your career. We go right back. You were, what, tw yeah, when you first started, it was about so you, early teens, 12, something like that? I mean, that, I 13? wrote my first rap when I was 12. I probably wrote my first song at 14. I did my first gig at 17. But I didn't really get going until I was, like, 24. I mean, nowadays, because uh, of Instagram, Spotify, SoundCloud, and laptops have just got so easy to produce music on, whereas my, my generation, I'm 40 now, most of my generation were, I can have an Xbox for Christmas or a PlayStation. Yeah. A lot of kids now in their 12th, 13th, you know, like, can have a laptop so they can edit or make music. So kids are just making music at a much younger age now. But it's, we talked about it yourself and Ed, but the, the speed of which you, you're constantly thinking about music. It must... I'm constantly, I just re re released my eighth album. Um, and I've already got my ninth album ready. But when you're doing an album, do you, am I right in thinking you have to do 200 songs and then pick your favourite, or...? Yeah, or so it... Ed, uh, in particular, like, every time I see him, I'm always blown away. Like, I think he's maybe slowed down a bit since he's had kids, but he would do a stadium gig and then set up a, a you know, a, a pop-up um, studio backstage. Yeah. I don't think he's doing it so much now he's, if he's got the kids there. But he's always writing and he'll fly in his writing partners. So John, it, Johnny McDade, who's in Snow Patrol, yeah. co-writes a lot of Ed stuff. But it uh, seems to be like what you do as well, because you're, you know... You're... No, I'm constantly writing. I, re I recorded three songs in a day last week. And I don't know how many of those are going to get released. And some of them may never get released. But you have to treat songwriting, rapping, as... Uh, like, it's like getting ready for a boxing match. You know, you've always got to be match fit. And I think it's like a sharpening of the tools. Like, I might write 30 songs and only release five of them, but there's something probably in the other 25 songs that led to the other five being so good. When you first do your, your first album, you know, that's accumulation of a lot of things. Your childhood, yeah. growing up, yeah, yeah. you know, t 12 years old, and, you know, there's a, there's a lot of input that you're putting into that. Yeah. Do you find the pressure even...? I actually find it easier to write songs than ever right now. It's almost, like, second nature to me. Um, and I guess, like, I mean... Is that because you're, you're writing for other people as well? You're doing... Yeah, I'd write songs for other people, but, I mean, it's more like... I mean, I cook, I, as you know, I cook a lot. Like, every, not, like, just once a day. Like, I'm breakfast, lunch, dinner, I'm usually making stuff. But yeah. I do it now so often that it's second nature, so I don't really even think about what I'm making. I sort of... 
I don't, I hate measuring things. I just sort of make stuff up as I go along, whether that's songwriting or cooking. And in the same way that I might slightly mess up a dish, I know how to sort of salvage it. Yeah. I do the same thing with a song in terms of I hear it back and I go, that chorus is world class. That verse is utter rubbish. And then I'll stay in the studio an extra half an hour to ensure the verse melodies are up to scratch. So you can relate it to that, I suppose, in the, in the cooking sort of uh, way. And I suppose so you're doing what you're used to do. I mean, saying that you used to... I mean, you've done the rounds, you've appeared in front of sort of, well, a room full of two or three people and you've, you've been there and done, done a gig. And then you're doing it now in front of thousands and thousands of people. Well, it's mad because I've had this cycle where at the very start of my career, I was only performing to, you know, I'd go to a pub in Hoxton and maybe have 20 people and 14 of them were just the local drunks. <laughs> and then, I, you know, in this, over the space of five or six years and four albums, I got to the headline in arenas and headline in festivals. And then a few years later, I was back performing in bottle clubs to, like, 2,000 people and then rebuilt my career from scratch uh, starting in 2018. And then at the other week, I played Latitude Festival which is a 40,000 capacity festival. I had the yeah. biggest crowd the entire weekend. So, so tell us about the new album. How does that, does it, does it differ from the rest? Or? It's the first time I've done the genre UK Garage. It's the first time I've done the genre drum and bass. But essentially, I always feel like I need to deliver festival bangers yeah. and lyrics that mean something to people. Like, I always think, all my songs over the years, is like, I want it to be people's first dance at a wedding if they want to have a party or maybe their first festival experience they think of me, or the, maybe their first kiss. That's the kind of lyrics I try and write. It's the thing with your music, though. It, it's, it, it crosses so many generations, doesn't it, really? It's not just... Well, I've got this, I'm looking in the crowd now, and there's, like, 12-year-olds, and they're singing, like, not just the hits, they're singing, like, the new stuff and the stuff from 10 years ago, and they know it word for word. Yeah. And then you realise that I used to just be obsessed with, oh, one day I'm going to get to 40, and all my fans who were 16 will be 25, and then, then you know, I'll maybe that's the end of my career. But then, because a lot, of, a lot of my peer group from around 2010 have all disappeared. They've either burnt out, retired, yeah. or just can't write songs anymore. And I'm not saying that in a nasty way. It's just, it's a very tough industry to stay relevant in for even a few years, let alone Well, just to show you, show you about how relevant you are, let's have a, have a listen to you, the track off the new album. While I'm taking this steak, look at this, look at this steak. A bit of tarragon as well. Yeah, a little bit of tarragon. Carry on the Bernays phase, I've just got a little bit of... Foaming butter there, and we're just going to nappy this over the top while we listen to the new track. So, that's one. Here you go. Just see me in action. I can breathe, my heart's on fire. But you make me feel like life's just fine. Even when I'm looking in the mirror and I feel like I can't get by. I know that everything is going to be okay for me. Not lost it after eight albums. Not lost it. No. Not lost it. Look, we've got a lovely little steak over here. What I'm going to do is, the thing is with this, is what you, the idea is to continue cooking this with a foaming butter. As the foaming butter starts to go brown, you get this amazing flavour. It doesn't burn, just goes not brown, and that's going to keep it nice and medium. This is your little gastric. So this is the, this is what you use to flavour the hollandaise. The hollandaise is in here. Yeah. This is your classic sort of sauce. But yeah. it, it's not actually hollandaise yet. That's just egg yolks and clarified butter. The clarified butter, you just put it over a pan of hot water like that, yeah. that it clarifies itself. That's it. I'm teaching a chef here, you know. So, so you just take Gl this... Glorified cook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what well done about that? You did all right. did all right on TV. I've been watching. Uh, <laughs> so, look, you take this, this sort of gastric. Now, a lot of chefs will... So it's like shallots, tarragon, mustard... Shallots, tarragon, uh, white peppercorns... And white peppercorns. White peppercorns, vinegar and white wine. You don't have to put the white wine in, but... Uh, this this turns it into a hollandaise. And then if we blend this with the tarragon in there, with some salt, with some black pepper, this turns it into your classic sort of Bernays that goes with it. We blend all that. What a well. hassle. Well, <laughs> so this turns it into your classic sort of Bernays sauce to go with your chips, which is really, really nice. So you must you must love getting back out on the road as well now, but in particular, you know, where you were, where you were, where you live in, you know, Australia had one of the toughest sort of rules around at one particular well, time. Well, yeah, I mean, we were in Queensland, so we weren't too affected. Actually, during COVID, we only had six weeks of lockdown in Brisbane. 
was well, the rest of the world was months. Uh, but I suppose that you you weren't allowed to do any, were you allowed to do festivals then? Well, or? check this. So Melbourne was absolutely you know they went through it. Uh, Western Australia was pretty bad. Perth. Yeah. Sydney was all right at the start, and then just as the world was opening up, Sydney went really bad. Yeah. Queensland was really we were really lucky in Queensland and Brisbane. So and also Darwin, which is in the Northern Territory. So interestingly enough. I played one of the last ever shows in the UK before COVID. I then played the first festival in the Western world, anywhere in the world, in Darwin yeah. in October 2020. So the rest of the world was um, the UK full lockdown, America was full lockdown, uh, Melbourne was in full lockdown, so was Sydney. And I was flown up to Darwin, had a PCR test, and I played a festival to 4,500 people. And I posted it on Instagram. And obviously, everyone else's pictures were just of their living room <laughs> or, you know, their garden yeah. or walking a dog. Yeah. And people were just like, what is this witchcraft? And I was just like, no, that's, that was yesterday. And people were like, what the hell's going on in Australia? <laughs> and then there's people in Melbourne going, you shouldn't post this, this is really unfair. I was like, what do you mean? But I, was, I played the first festival anywhere in the world. Is it everything? During COVID. I've always wanted to ask this. I've known you for uh, several years now. Is it everything you thought it would be? Well, this career. Yeah, this job. Uh, it's because you have it's you, very have, tough. you know I mean, you've no had one it... prepares you for it. No one. You don't. You know you don't sign a record deal or you know release your first single or have a hit single and people go, it's everything's going to be all right. It, no, it, there's no one actually warns you. But most people, you know, they burn out or they just can't handle it mentally. I think it's it's a tough job. Well, I want to talk to you about your most early of my career. friends are actually they've all depressed or got mental illnesses or addictions, and it's all because the music industry has messed them up. I want to talk about that a little bit later on the show, but I just want to finish off this. So this is this little steak, and we finish it off. With an oxo, dude. Yeah. Over the top. Is this? Yeah, this is... Is this, this... a well-known thing? Well, this is this is something... Next time... Next Add time... extra beefiness. Next time I see you on a, a cookery show, and you got... There's a little bit of oxo cube over the top. Other cubes are See, I'm going to start doing this at home when I cook for people, but not tell anyone about yeah, the Oxo cube. Don't, don't. It, honestly... <laughs> they're going to go, this steak's unbelievable, Elliot. What have you done to this? <laughs> honestly, well, you've got amazing beef in Australia, for sure. Mm. But you just take your nice little bit of steak like that, which has been rested. There we go. Oh, my God. And then take a little bit of this, but it's, it's that touch of stock cube over the top that transforms this. So you got a bit of that. Are you like the main guy who does this? Did you did you start this? No, I'll be this? honest with you. I, I grabbed this idea. There's, a, there's an amazing chef called Wolf. Well, you know, you know chefs all over the world. There's a chef called Wolfgang Puck. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, and he runs a restaurant called Cut. Yeah, I've been there in, yeah. in Vegas. In Vegas. He's got another one in Beverly Hills and bits and pieces. And he was I was cooking together with him in this kitchen and he got a T-bone steak and he just took a stock cube and put it over the top. <coughs> ever since then I've done it. It tastes amazing. That, that is actually the best steak I've ever had at his place. Well, I've got my work cut out now, then. I'm, I'm up against Wolfgang Puck with a steak. But there you have your nice little bit of Bernay sauce to go with it, with a dollop of Bernay sauce on the side. So, Elliot, it's a sweet pleasure having you on the show. You're going to stick around, because we're going to talk to you a little bit more later. I want to talk about the music industry, more about your album, bits and pieces. But for now, steak, chips and Bernay sauce. Done. <laughs> Steak, chips, Bernay sauce. Thank you very much. This is a starter, if that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have breakfast on purpose. Well, there's more coming anyway, but tell me, tell me what you think of that. Here we go. Tell me what you think. Mm. Oh, my God. <laughs> Happy? Unbelievable. Uh, nicely cooked, all cooked for you? Mm, very good. Job's good. Enjoy that one. Elliot, everybody. Yes. Uh, right, I'll be treating into a Moroccan spatchcock chicken a little bit later, and mm. Chef Romy Gill will be making a visit to the house very shortly. But join me again after the break, where Mr Paul Rankin will be treating us to a recipe uh, that he doesn't even know what's going to be doing yet. But anyway, it's going to be chaos. I'll see you after the break. Mmm. Welcome back. Now, there's still loads more to come from my guest example, uh, and we'll be looking at some seasonal fish recipes in this week's little masterclass. But first, I'm here in the kitchen with a good friend who needs no introduction. 
as he doesn't need to introduce his recipes either because he's making it up entirely as he goes along, like usual. It's Mr Paul Rankin! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> am I right or am I wrong? This will be the second time I've cooked this dish. I made this up right. just to do it on this show. You've made this up, right. So here I am, spouting my expertise to the whole nation, right. when really I haven't a clue what I'm doing. <laughs> God, what are you going to be doing there? What are these called? Duck pot stickers. <coughs> pot stickers? Well, pot stickers. People... They're, like, they're like wee Chinese dumpling kind of things. Right, OK. Um, I had pork pot stickers on the, the, the Cayenne restaurant menu when it was open for about 10 years. Right. So, yeah, I do know a thing or two about pot stickers, but uh, these are duck ones. So. Why are they called pot stickers as opposed to dumplings? Be well, because they actually, you actually let them stick to the bottom of the pan, right. which allows them to crisp up and become sort of deliciously crispy on the bottom. So okay. it's kind of like a dumpling or a ravioli yeah. um, until, until they crisp up kind of thing, you know? So they're going to take about seven or eight minutes to cook like this. Okay. So you lightly oil the pan first. Yeah. The pan's on, by the way. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, last time I cooked noodles yeah. on this stove, James. <laughs> we know that. Yeah. You blamed it on me, didn't you? Well, it was your fault. You turned it up. You thought it'd be funny. <laughs> Can I just say I was sat over there? Oh, you might have been. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In my so, head, you so, it up. So the idea is to uh, you allow these to stick together or try and get them to stick together, is that...? Uh, well, the, 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 you pour in a little bit of water, about... A, that's about a glass of water. We might need to top it up slightly. Right. And so the steam will come up and cook them beautifully. Yeah. Eventually, the water will evaporate, and then they'll start to crisp, crisp on the up bottom. on the base. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I mean, these are almost exactly the same as gyozo, you know, the, yeah. the Japanese ones that you get... So we're going to get on and show you how to make these, yes, first we are. of all. So, we... so what have we got on here, then, first? So here we've got some I mean, minced pork, here. Yeah. Some, some lean duck, a little bit of duck liver, and some pork fat. Now, when you're making a stuffing or, or a terrine type of thing, say you're making venison terrine or some, you know, classically in French-type stuff, you need... Half of it to be pork and pork fat, and half yeah. of it to be the flavour that you're looking for. Yeah. So, so this is... It's really nice and cold type of thing. OK. So it'll mince properly. All right. Now, I'm just going to start the sauce, which is a play on... You know, like the, the, the crispy duck with hoisin sauce and yeah. the crispy pancakes and stuff? Right. So we're going to make a sort of hoisin jus. Right. Um, which is really delicious. Okay. What got you into this style of food anyway, then? Well, I travelled a lot uh, when I was younger. Yeah. And I was actually in China for five months in 1983. Um, and I watched a guy... Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I ate pot stickers from a guy cooking them on a bin lid. Right. On a bin lid. And I, a bin lid. Yeah. And they were fantastic. I mean, yeah. the street food in China back then was astonishingly good. Yeah. So a little pinch of chilli flakes, a little bit of ginger. This is for the sauce now. A couple of star anise. A little bit of soy. Well, that one's on too, James. Yeah, I'll put it on for you. I need to get a, the, a little bit of duck stock or chicken stock, whatever this is. OK. In there. Yeah. We're on telly, so we can do... We can make it up. <laughs> <laughs> what is this now? Here we are, you know, a bit of brown sauce. That's oh, oyster sauce, isn't it? That, oh, hoisin, right stuff. Oh, hoisin, so it's not That's brown it. sauce, as we know well, it. It could be brown sauce <laughs> in a hoisin bottle. <laughs> For all you know at home, we could be just making all this up. Well, you are. No, you do normally. I do all the time, actually. Right. OK, job done there. There you go. So this sauce just needs to sit and reduce a little bit. Yeah. So what the key to that really is is not let them dry out just yet. Yeah. Really well, the, the, the key is that they should be cooked. Yeah. At the same time as the water evaporates off. Okay. And how long would they take to cook? Six, eight minutes, something like that. Six, eight, seven okay. minutes. Yeah. Okay. That type of thing. So, okay. all right. What's next? Our seasoning for this yeah. is about a tablespoon of garlic. So this is back to where we were before when making these. This is our little dumpling filling. You know. So the easiest way to do this is, is pork pot stickers. And you go to an Asian supermarket and just buy fatty pork mints yeah. and, and just start to add the seasoning rather than having to mince your own. Okay. If yeah. you don't have a mincer, just make sure you chill it down really well yeah. and 
do it slowly or carefully in a food processor. Because otherwise, if you yeah. do it too fast, it can cook it. it yeah, gets too a, hot. A, a bit of a tablespoon and a half of ginger. Yeah. A nice big pinch of white pepper. Yeah. Uh, an egg with a bit of shell for texture. <laughs> no, there wasn't anything in there. I was just saying that. Oh, just, um, you, now, this is where you get to a stage where you want a little bit of water in here, do you? Yeah, we're going to put a bit more water in there. Okay. So. But you can hear the cracking. You, see, you can yeah. hear it starting to catch. Yeah. Yeah. Happy? Ish. Ish? Well, I just remember you... you... Well, I'd be happier if, if I was sitting over there having a glass of wine and you were... <laughs> <laughs> right, so the sauce reducing down to get yeah. thick. Yeah. yeah. Now, we're just going to mix this up. You're going to have a go at making some of these, James, with me, are you? I'll well, I'm going to do the... I'm going to do the, uh, the, the uh, lettuce for you as well. Oh, yes. Uh... I'm sure we to do that. Because we forgot all about that, actually. Yeah, that's why I'm doing it. That's why I'm here. Yeah. So a little Thank goodness you're here. I, so, so I prefer it when you're here beside me and not over there doing, we know the, that. We know doing that. the COVID exactly. social distancing. Yeah, we know thing. that. So t tell me about what you've been up to then, because the little birdie tells me you've been you've been away for two months in a in a monastery. Is that right? I went away to a Zen monastery. I was so traumatized the last time I was on your show, I had to go and sort myself <laughs> out. We got picked up in the newspapers that we were both wearing the same shirts and <laughs> da, da, disaster on James. Ma Paul right. and James were so, No, I, I took myself off. I've always been interested in this type of thing. Yeah. How do you stay quiet for two months? Well, obviously, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but don't you have to in a Zen monastery? There, we, well, there are certain practice periods where, where you'll be silent for a week or two weeks or something like that. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so what do you do in a Zen monastery? What, what, what um, happens there? There's a lot of meditation, uh, a lot of contemplation, a lot of only vegetarian food, which is lovely and delicious. Um, you know, one of the lovely things I think that I can relate to as a cook with, with the Zen practice is that in Zen, one of the most important things is kind of being awake to your life. And another way to put that would be to pay attention to your life. And that's something that really fits into cooking. Because when, if you're, you're a good... getting a bit deep. I've known, if, you, for, I've known if, you for 30 years. What's happened? If you're a good cook, though, one of, the, one of the things is that you do is you pay attention and you treat everything with sort of love and kindness and yep. stuff like that. And so I find it very interesting how even just the simple philosophy of Zen fits into cooking. So we pay attention, we make good food. Yeah. Yeah. OK, with this filling... So I'm salting this now, yeah? Yes, two teaspoons of salt goes on that. <coughs> then it comes out, out like this, so it's kind of like a pickled cabbage now. OK, so that's that one. And that goes in along with the egg yolk, the white... So was this, was this in the UK, this, this...? No, this was in San Francisco. Right. At uh, one of the, the San Francisco Zen Centre. It's one of the top Zen places in the world, actually. Um, and it was lovely. You know what? It was kind of like a gift to myself, you know? Like, just to sort of... You see parts of life that you didn't even really know existed. And I'm not even going to tell you about them. You and I are going next week. I hope you know this. <laughs> <laughs> are, we, are we? Oh, yeah. Are we? I think those pot stickers are cooked. Okay. Yeah. I think they're not far off. Yeah, we'll just leave them a little so bit just longer. Just leave them a little longer. Maybe this sauce is reducing down nicely. Yeah. I'll just tiny bit more oil on this, maybe. Just shake that so in. So just remember, bit. just remember, he did this on a bin lid, and it worked perfectly. You've got, you've got this amazing French stove and a, 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 a sixty quid. That stove fryer doesn't pan. like me. What? <laughs> Goes in. Goes in. Uh, exactly. It does like you. It, it, it applies to everything. I need to make friends with that. Yeah, like, exactly. that, with that, and pay attention. Yeah. So Next. now, with the filling, you want to work it until it starts to get tacky. And it's the same when you make a terrine and the same okay. when you make sausages. Yeah. You know, you kind of need to activate the protein a little bit so, yeah. that, so that you get everything nicely blended and it... So that's about it now, yeah? So this sauce, are you bringing it down so it's sticky or not? Uh, that's enough now, that's yeah, enough. yeah. Okay. So I these think, are starting we can to... turn the pot stickers off. If you listen to these. We'll just check one. A little bit more, yeah. It's not very even, that stuff, Jim. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> Easy, boy. All right, now. Yeah. So let's make one of, one of these. Yeah. You're going to make one? 
Go on then. So what do you use to what you use water, don't you? Just stick it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it looks like quite a complicated technique, but it's not. It's really so dead what easy. What are these? These are dumpling pastry. You buy these frozen right. in the Chinese. They're all, they're, these are sticking together because they've been out under the lights. <laughs> Look at us trying to. We've got I've one got, each. I've, I've got, got one. I've got one. I've got one. Yeah. yeah. So you're you're good with your pastry, yeah. dainty hands kind of thing. So it's just a t dainty hands. Well, dainty yeah. hands. Can it, just put your hands up like that. I've got bigger hands than you. Don't put you slid that hand up there. See, he's got way bigger so hands. How can I you. have dainty hands? <laughs> <laughs> so d go for a teaspoon. Don't right. don't do much more than a teaspoon. Or you'll kind of regret it. You put more than a teaspoon. Um, in yours, I did, yeah. But <laughs> it's okay. Me up. It's okay. You just damp, damp the end of it. Yeah. And you can just pull it down so it goes a little bit more lengthwise. Just fold it over. Okay. To a half moon. So it's like a pasty then. Ish. Yeah. And then we're going to do three pleats on this side. So it's one, two, three. One, two, three. And then back round to this side. And it's one, one, two, two three. three. And then you just press it lightly. That's pretty good for your first attempt, James. I, I that's it's that's a wee that's bit that's skew whiff. I'll leave you I'll leave you to concentrate on these ones. So, so can we it. turn this off now? Yeah, it's, it's off. It's, it's off. off. Cool. It's off. There you go. All right, let's check out the pot stickers. Look at this. Absolutely glorious. I mean, these are, they're quite therapeutic to make these, aren't they, when you get... Aren't they? Yeah. It's the sort of... I'm in my Zen mode. So it's, it's, it's almost like a community thing, isn't it? You can get the whole Zen community together. I'm in my Zen, and I've saved my yeah. money on a flight ticket for, to San Francisco. Look. Ah, uh, well, there's a few... Soto Zen places in, in the UK, too. Um, and I'm just going to add... Now, classically, with pot stickers, it's a sort of vinegar dipping sauce type right. thing. So I'm just going to add a bit of vinegar. The hoisin's quite sweet, yeah. so it then becomes quite sweet and sour, but it really does suit... It really does suit the, uh, the pot stickers. Oh, we'll, just, we'll just put it around the edge. So would these be done as a dipping sauce, or are you doing there? You're just making it up and sticking them over the top? I'm kind of just making this up, man. Right. Okay. I've never done this one before. But in the past, we, we used to serve it with a dipping sauce, a sort of vinegar, soy, chilli dipping sauce type thing. I'll get that. Um, and this is just a little bit of microcress over the top. So that's... But you say this, I mean, you said, well, well, before you started doing this, this has been on your menu, it was in your mess, restaurant menu at KN for... Ten for, for ten years. Mm. As pork pot stickers, yeah. We did it with an apple slaw and a vinegar chilli dipping sauce. So give us the name of this dish then. That's duck pot stickers with a hoisin rice vinegar jus. And I've learned more about you in the last eight minutes than I've done in 20 years. Oh, give us a hug. Give us a hug. Is that... Paul Rankin, everybody. <laughs> Legend. Chopsticks, fingers, fingers, fingers. Da da get your dainty fingers in there, James. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's the sort of grub you want to eat, isn't it? It is really good. Mm. It is really good. And you say you've got to get these sort of crispy as well, you just leave it. Yeah. Really great, aren't they? That is absolutely delicious. Isn't it? It mm. really, really is. Mm. And they still say nice and moist. You've got the crispy there at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. The dressing that's super as well. Yeah. Mr. Paul Rankin, everybody! <laughs> Legend. Mm. Right, Romy Gill, uh, the chef, will be trying to top Trump Paul's dish a little bit later on this morning. And I'll be laying on lunch for my guest's example at the end of the show. But join me again after a couple of minutes when Paul and I will be swapping the kitchen for four wheels as we explore the world of food trucks. You're going to like this one. One has just arrived outside. You promise? You're going to like this, trust me. I don't trust you at all. It's zen. <laughs> You're going to love it. <laughs> See you in a bit.
Welcome back. Now I'll be making a Moroccan chicken dish for my guest example later, and we've got a dish on the way from Chef Romy Gill in a little while. But first, I'm outside. I'm looking forward to this bit, and I'm going to be learning everything there is to know about setting up and running your own food truck from this lady over here, Elizabeth Brown from Coco La Belle. First of all, welcome to the show. Welcome to my house. Thank you for having We've me. We've never done this before. You're the very, very first. I'm so happy to be here. <clears throat> because I've seen all these sort of trucks pop up over the festivals. It's become hugely popular. It's very popular. We started in 2016 and we've been doing all the small markets to all the big, large weddings, uh, festivals and um, private and corporate events. So tell me how it started for you, because food wasn't your first love. It was law. Law was my first love right. because we have a lot of uh, academics and lawyers in the family yeah. and that was a natural progression and I fell in love with human rights. Right. My background, I'm from Mauritius, so I was really passionate about what happens in Mauritius, so I really wanted to follow my law into human rights and campaign in that way. However, I did find that, you know, my passion, I've been cooking food since I was about eight years old. Yeah. I've been making rotis and pizzas and pastas with my mum and making cakes with my mum, so, you know, it's just naturally something that once I had my children was a natural avenue for me to take. Well, You've got a perfect commie for you. We got me here talking about human rights. <laughs> <laughs> Can I not get this ceiling put up? I mean, I'm kind of like, oh, what would you have me do? <laughs> it's not really built for six footers in here, is it? I really? mean, we've got about a five foot ten, five foot eleven limit. Yeah. But, uh... Do you need me to be doing anything for you? So yeah. let's get some food out to Joe so and let, see what he do thinks. Do me a little mutton curry to start off with. Because I've just checked out the menu, is it? So, so tell me how it all started then, because you, you ended up going to Westminster Catering College. I did. Finishing, finishing law, doing Westminster Catering College. You met your partner, would you? I mean, I your, my, part, yeah. your partner's a very successful drummer. He is a very successful and amazing musician. Absolutely. Pretty amazing. And yeah. that's obviously the link into festivals, isn't it? Well, actually, it was the good food that brought us into the festivals and this right. amazing truck. Having a stunning truck and great food was really a winner. Well, fire away yeah. then. What, what have we got first? Let me have a little bit taste this curry. What's, the, what's in the curry? So we've got well, a, the rice is down there, isn't it? The rice is down here. I'm going to get you some rice. You're going to do me some curry mutton. And I'll do that. Add some salad. We're going to add some garnish and a yeah. fork and we'll get James a taster. Cool. Sounds pretty good to me. So the, the food that you're serving, it, it's, it's influenced by your home? Back in Mauritius, is it? Or is it just food you like to eat? Well, this is everything that we eat at home. This is all our favourites and what everybody eats when they come round to our house. Oh, so James. I'm Mauritian. Mutton curry, dude. <laughs> I'm Mauritian and Italian, and my partner is Jamaican. And so these are just our beautiful favourites. Not too much, because... We're going to get some Wait, salad. Are these chilies or stocks so of thyme? Or... beautiful thyme that we just let marinate yeah. in there that you can just put Put that lots in of that in, James. Yeah. So, yes, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to leave that in for you. Let's leave it, them, leave it. It's, 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 I actually had a haircut last week, so that's it's right, just... Let's have this one. Right, I'm going to have a little Oh, yeah, that's got all the condiments. I'll have a taste of that it's stuck in. So this is the first one. What else What else are you going to be doing? Because I've seen a fantastic menu that you've got on here as well. Let's get a plate and mm -hmm. we're going to get the farata and get some rougaiton on there for James. I love Paul's I have no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> what did you just tell me to do? Let's do it together. Come on, then. Is this the plate you That's want? That's the plate. Nice, sustainable plates. Oh, beautiful bamboo palm leaf uh -huh. plates. So, so, so these are like uh, so these, Mauritian paranta? So they are a farata. But so similar to what you would know as a roti, mm -hmm. but these are the ones we eat at home. This is what on mm -hmm. your table every day. You have this with a cup of tea, with your butter. You have you this. Yeah, perfect. And how, what is this? So let's get these in here like that. It's nice like and tomato and fish. So it's yeah. a tomato and tuna dish, which is called mm -hmm. rougai. Mm -hmm. So, so where does this come from? Rougai. This is the Mauritian national dish. Is having a rougai always on your table, so you can have anything in it. Today, my favourite is the tuna one. But you can have eggs, you can have sausages, salt fish. Absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. So Garnish. what is the base of that? How do you how do you make it? So, the key is in the name, so rougai, which is from the word uh, rougai, which is a roux of garlic and ginger and onions. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect, with uh, coriander and thyme. And then you really want to slowly love it and make it with tomatoes and stewed tomatoes into it until they really break down and release all that juice. And then you want to add your parsley and your coriander and your tuna, finish it with your tuna, and just really let those beautiful flavours just married together well, because you, you have to get a spoon and taste that taste that curry that doesn't sound particularly indian or anything what, what where is it that's a creole or something so it's creole we are from the creole community some and there's some of that on there some coriander as well mm -hmm. and i'm going to give you this amazing coconut chutney which you're gonna love okay and this what, amazing coriander I'm, I'm chutney. i'm stuffing myself for the food here what what is that 
So these are our fish goujons. Right. And we're going to get mm, that that's banging. with our How good is that cool? that's tamarind banging. sauce. Let me get some tamarind sauce on here for you. Yeah. Wait till you taste this sauce. Absolutely gorgeous. Everybody... Where do you get the goats from, you? So this you is You just mutton. chase them down at the side of the road, don't <laughs> you? You're having mutton today, but no, I wouldn't uh -huh. be chasing any goats down the side of the road. They're all friends. They come in our garden. <laughs> I knew you'd <it's> right. <laughs> James, have a taste of that to, one. It's hard to catch a goat. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever tried to catch a goat? Have I ever tried to catch a goat? Why would, I, why would I possibly catch a goat? What, what possible reason would I want to catch a goat it's for? It's good fun Sorry about this. The conversation's disappearing, but go on. Mm. Have you ever caught a goat? Yeah. How do you catch a goat? Not by its horns. Give it a couple of pints of Guinness first, <laughs> and then they're much easier to catch. <laughs> <laughs> Tamarind sauce, and that's fab fabulous, isn't it? Gorgeous sauce. Mm. Really reduced it down with chilies and coriander and garlic. So there's going to be a lot of people sauce. watching this. You've you've now gone on from, you know, from law to to a catering college, to doing events, to got in a truck, to now the business is expanding. You've got a, you're looking again in a factory to producing the food. So absolutely. So we've uh, we got to about seven years with the truck, and we, then we got onto the NHS supply chain. That took us on to having a production facility, and now we are salsa approved and approved premises as a manufacturing site. And our very first contract, as we were wor wor working our way into the NHS and introducing our food to them, because it, it is a bit of a slow process. You have to introduce the food, keep feeding people so that they enjoy the flavours. Bit like been here. Slow and it. our very first contract was one that we made. 111,000 meals for a very large event, and we supply uh, 35. 111,000. <laughs> 111,000. Yes, <laughs> yes. Are you available next week? <laughs> <laughs> and we supplied them in. I'd rather trays. catch goats. <laughs> That's too many, huh? We supplied them in uh, frozen trays. We had a whole supply chain set up, and they right. went out um, and served a very large event. We did 35 different African and Caribbean lines, Kenyan food. Now I'm gonna. There's, there's going to be people watching this going. Do you know what? Next year, I quite fancy doing this. I've got this idea. I've got this because it is a it is a dream. You see a lot of these food trucks at festivals. Festivals yeah. coming so popular now. Yeah. Some doing it right, some doing it wrong. Give us give us a few of the pitfalls that give us a few of the do's do's and don'ts that people. If they've got an idea, what have you learned from this? Look, if you want to have a street food business, I highly recommend getting a van, getting a truck. Yeah. The gazebo life is very hard and will kill you very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, and it's not sustainable. <laughs> it will kill you very, very quickly. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I suppose, you know, you've got to be careful of the weather. Yeah. You might sell loads if it's sunny. You might not sell anything if it's too Camilla, hot. Well, one thing from your human rights perspective, check the height of the truck before you and the members of staff you employ before you Absolutely. start buying. Yeah. I didn't send a waiver before I came in here, so <laughs> expect a massive <laughs> claim coming in. <laughs> exactly. said you'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely fantastic. Thank you for joining as well. This is It's been a real, real treat. We've never done this before, but... You're welcome. It's fantastic. And we'll we'll see you at one of the many, many festivals next year as well. Thank you so good much. Good luck with I'll everything. And in the NHS as well. And in the NHS. Congratulations. Thank How you. good is that? Thank you. Elizabeth Brown, everybody. Yay. Brilliant, that. Brilliant, that. Thank Save you. the food, because there's got a queue going to be forming in a minute. Uh, still to come, I'll be treating an example to my spatch cup chicken, uh, Moroccan style, and Chef Romy Gil will be serving up some traditional Kashmiri yes, cooking. Uh, but join me again in a couple of minutes when we're back in the kitchen for a masterclass in seasonal fish. I'll see you in a sec. Let the queue commence. In we go, crew. In you go. In you go. Welcome back. Now I'll be rustling up a spot of lunch for my guest example very shortly, and Chef Romy Gill will be working on magic in the kitchen next. But first, it's time for this week's Little Masterclass, and to mark Sustainable Fish Week, we're going to take a look at some of the best fish in season right now. And interestingly enough, these are some of the chef's favourite fish you can get anyway. We've talked about the sardines at the beginning of the show. These are Cornish uh, uh, sardines. All the fish that I get anyway in, in the restaurant that we use for the show anyway uh, are sustainable, and, and they're all line caught in that way. We'll get on to that in a minute. But the sardines that we've got on there are fantastic. I'm going to do two dishes, really, with this one. One is just a grilled mackerel dish, and the other one is a, a beautiful moule marinière. But we're going to start off with a mackerel over here, which is, I think, one of the prized fishes you can get, really. One of the most sustainable fishes, purely the fact you can get them line caught. And if you've ever gone fishing in the, uh, in the sea, you'll know how easy it is to catch these amazing mackerel and how delicious they are 
when you catch them fresh. And they really need to be fresh. So wherever possible, buy them whole like that. They usually got it anyway in the centre, but buy them whole because you can see the eyes are nice and fresh. They shouldn't smell. The gills are lovely and red, which they are. Um, and you've got this beautiful, look at the, the rigor mortis on that, look. Look, it's absolutely amazing. Beautiful, beautiful fish mackerel. It's one of these amazing tasting fish that chefs absolutely love. Now, people don't like them in various different reasons, and I think it's because of the bones. I'm going to show you how to get rid of the bones in a minute, but I think when you're cooking them on the barbecue, uh, and this is the perfect time of year to cook these on the barbecue, you need to cook them whole. So make sure they've been gutted out. I keep the head on. It's entirely up to you. It's People don't like the eyes looking at them, but they're just weird people. Anyway, this, this you just take the nice little knife like that and you cut them. And you score this either side. Now, the reason why we score it is to allow the heat to penetrate inside as well. So just score it like that. And then down again. Do that one. You cut it through. And then all we need to do is then just grab a little bit of olive oil, which you've got on here tiny bit of olive oil over the top, rub that over the fish, a bit of seasoning, black pepper, see how easy this is, a bit of salt over the top, and then this could go straight on the barbecue, like that. So I'll put that on there, that can go straight on there. But like I said, if you don't want bones in the fish, it's, it's one of the easiest fish to fill it, really, and I'll just show you how. Really simple. Nature's amazing. It's drawn a little line on the top there, the backbone. What you do is insert the knife underneath the gills like that, retake the knife the other way, and then slide the knife along the backbone. And if you slide it along the backbone like that, the fillet just comes straight off. Easy as this. Easy, easy, easy. And then what you can do is then you can take the little rib cage out, which is there, and then what you'll have is little pin bones in this, little tiny little bones down the centre. So what we're going to do is just we cut, create a little V cut and we cut a little V either side of those bones and then we lift out the central bit. You can cook it identical as what you're doing over here. Keep your eye on it as well. That's it. And don't worry about it sticking. Don't worry about that. People panic a bit. Oh, it's sticking to the thing. It will do anyway. Don't worry about it. It's oily fish anyway. But you want it to sort of char at the same time. Like that. It's th this is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So we're going to leave that to one side. The fillets, you just cook exactly the same way. So a little bit of oil on here, touch of black pepper, a little bit of salt, and that can go straight on the coals, look. Wallop, straight on there. While that's on, we'll put this pan over here and we'll start cooking our mussels. One of the finest, finest ingredients, I think, this country produces really is amazing shellfish as well. And mussels is one of them. These come from the River X. They're absolutely delicious. But look, would you can turn that fish over? Oh, look at this. Look at this. You got look at this. Perfect. Like that. Fish is that's amazing that. So while that's cooking, we create before we get on and do that, uh, a little little uh, mussels. We'll then take a touch of fresh thyme. Take a little bit of garlic. And we can use this to sort of flavour our mackerel while that's cooking. So grab ourselves a little fresh thyme like that. A little bit of extra virgin olive oil over there. Some salt and pepper. There we go. Over the top. And you can either use a pastry brush or you've got fresh thyme, particularly growing in your garden. You can actually use the thyme as a brush itself. So you just pop that over the top. But look at that. Oh, that's just so, so good. And it's so quick to cook. I cannot tell you, look. It's almost cooked already. We can then just lift this off. Like this. Look at that. And then you've got a spoon where you've got this garlic, thyme, dressing, that kind of stuff, over the top. And this is how you serve mackerel. Don't mess around with it too much. It's great quality fish as well, as it is. A little bit of lemon on there. I love dishes like this. And maybe just a touch of parsley. And we're just going to take a little bit of chopped parsley and just sprinkle it over the top. I mean, look at that. 
Absolutely wonderful, wonderful, wonderful little dish, that. Tastes amazing. And of course, you've got your wonderful little fillet over here, which, again, super, super quick to cook on the barbecue. You're almost cooking this all the way through, look. And that's how you want to cook the fish, just so it's just cooked. See that? We can then turn this over. And that's how you want that sort of flavour skin. You want it crispy. So we're just going to take more of this oil. The same thing again. With fish like this, it's the simplicity of how you cook it that I think makes the difference. Again, a little bit of... I know this show I go on. This is like cooking for myself. I get so excited when I'm cooking like this. I get a bit carried away. Sort of ignore the cameras or even here, to be honest with you, but that... That are two fantastic dishes, all just using mackerel. Really, really simple, but like I said, that's the key to mackerel. You don't want to cook it on the barbecue, pop it under the grill. Nice hot grill, it does exactly the same thing. You want skin to char while you're doing it, it's absolutely fabulous. Another thing, like I said, with sustainable, we've talked about the mussels over here. Moor marinier, one of the most amazing dishes around. So to start with a really good moor marinier, you need some onion. You can use shallot for this, but the thing is, you need to make sure that the onion are sort of finely diced, or as diced small as you can get them, really. That's that. And we want a pan with a lid. So we've got the onions on here. We want a little bit of garlic. So touch garlic, make sure that's nice and thinly sliced as well. As much garlic as you like. Some people like more garlic, it's entirely up to you. But that's gonna go in there as well. And then we want butter. Never ever margarine. You should never cook with margarine, it's not food. Never has been food. That goes in here. Butter goes into the pan. In we go with the garlic and the onions. Now you want this to wilt down a little bit. And at the same time, to increase the flavour, we can add a little bit of fresh thyme in there. But another thing that I think works really well with uh, moule marinier is bay leaves. These are fresh bay leaves. You can use dried bay leaves as well, but just a couple of bay leaves in here as well. Start to wilt those down. And again, this is purely optional. Celery. Now, I had this in France, <coughs> and I put it in moule marinier ever since then. I think it's great. It's, it's entirely up to you, really. Celery is one of these things that has kind of left me scarred for life when I was a young kid. I used to have this when I used to get invited to weddings when I was very, very young. And funerals, you'd have this with cheese in a tube over the top of it. But that would go in there. And then once you're happy with this, and we've got a nice little bit of onions and garlic softened, we can then take our mould like this. and we can pop them in here. And then all that's required now is some white wine. I always say whatever white wine you're going to serve with it, that's the white wine you put in it. So mix that together. So now we've got all these lovely veg and everything else, the white wine, all that sort of stuff happening. Seasoning now. Black pepper. It's a good idea to season it now, really, rather than at the end. Otherwise, you start to break up the mussels so they start to open. So, decent amount of salt and pepper. And then the other liquid that we want in there now is just a touch of double cream. Double cream. So, once we've got the mussels in there, just give them a quick stir, like that. We've got the bay leaf, we've got the thyme, we've got everything else. Pop the lid on, and these are going to cook for about two or three minutes. In between time, our award-winning director, apparently is an award-winning director, that's what he said on his CV when he applied. I haven't seen the award yet. He'll go and find some sort of amazing wildlife out there in the garden. Off you go. See you in a bit. Now, I've got some toast over here. What I like to do, really, with either of these, really, with the mackerel or the, the mussels, is just take a little bit of toast and just rub it with garlic over the top. Just a clove of garlic, just rub it over the top like that. 
That's all the flavour you really need into this, rather than chopped garlic, but just nicely rubbed over the surface of the toasted bread, like that. And then a good drizzle of extra virgin olive oil over the top as well, like that. And you can just serve that to mop up any of the juices of you've got for the mackerel as well. But, of course, one last thing to finish off in our mussels is just some parsley. And you can finish this off in various different ways, really. It's in herb-wise, but parsley being the most commonly one, um, I've seen it and tasted it with tarragon, which is also really good. The tarragon's quite a strong herb, but you want less of it than what we're going to use in here. But just a little bit of chopped parsley at the end. The thing is about these mussels, you don't want to overcook them, and they only take a couple of minutes. That's all they're going to take. And then we can lift off the lid. Look at these. And then pop the parsley in and over the top. Like that. Give these a quick stir. Look at these. <laughs> Just look at them. Like that. And then we can just serve these as they are, really. I mean, I love serving these just in a pot like this, but if you want to serve them in bowls, that's cool, but, you know, just serve them as a, as a big pot of mussels in the middle of the table. They're just delicious, but over the top. Like that. If you've never tried them before, I urge you to try them. The, the, and if you tried them and didn't like them, try them again, because really, really good quality mussels. I mean, really good ones. And we have such amazing produce in this country, and mussels are, are one of the finest, I always think. But you know, try them again, because you'll absolutely adore them in the end. You really will, because you'll find the supplier that you like. They're just absolutely fantastic. Beautiful, meaty, banging season at the moment. And there we have it. So I have two dishes using my favourite fish from this amazing country of ours. Beautiful mussels, classic Beaumarnier. You can have these with chips, a little bit of bread, and just some grilled mackerel with a little bit of thyme, olive oil and lemon. That's all you need. Done. There you go. <laughs> now, if there's any you'd like to learn about it, a little ask us, then do get in touch. We'll see if we can help out right here on the show. Time now for a quick break, but join me again in a couple of minutes when it's Romy Gill's turn to get cooking. I'll see you in a minute. I'm going to eat that one. Welcome back. Now, I'll be cooking one more final dish for it, surely. But first, I'm here with a ready, steady cook star who's welcome in my kitchen anytime she likes. The fabulous Rummy Girl. <laughs> Ably assisted by her sous chef. Example over here. There you go. <laughs> Ellie, you don't know what you got yourself in for. I'll be Trust fine. Me. I'll be fine. Just don't watch me. <laughs> Keep your eyes on her. <laughs> well, we know you're a king cook, so I thought I'm going to sit down for a change and get you cooking as well. Right. So, uh, Rummy, what are we going to be doing then? What, so, I have some really... D delicious vegetarian recipes for my new book and my sous chef is helping me which is fantastic you said you didn't want to do anything so you just wanted to chat with me because you're so tired uh, <laughs> <laughs> cut this out i'm Who just wrote that start of the autocue she's welcome to my house anytime anyway we need to <laughs> have a little tweak of that can we you come to my house <laughs> exactly so, you live um, in australia you've got a long way to go can we come to australia then yeah when you do your books of australia yeah, yeah. You, i'll chop up for you actually howdy grant we have the same same publishing <laughs> go on, house. just we get on with doing the cooking what, what, what are you going to be doing um so can you uh please cut into half and then quarters okay. and then di dice some tomatoes that, do you want, you want it that way yeah, it's perfect. And then half it. Yes, okay. please. So I've already got some marinated here with some salt, with some turmeric. You're doing fine, James. He's doing uh, fine. Okay. Just yeah. mind your fingers, yeah? That's all right. Um, it's, it's, it's quartered. So I wanted to show you something. This do you is want it like that or do you want to quarter it again? Yes, okay. please. So I've got mustard oil here. So mustard oil, you have to be very careful. You have to bring it on a smoking point, you know, temperature. Right. You cannot have mustard oil... Um, like just put in salads and stuff. You have to bring it to a smoky temperature. Can you smell that? Yeah. Can you smell that? Oh, it's delicious. Yeah? Any reason why? It's because if you don't, you'll make you really ill. 
Okay. So you Sorry. have to make sure you bring to a temperature when it starts to smoke and you see that smoke and then you're going to add all the ingredients to it. Okay. So I'm going to kind of fry this. So it's got turmeric, it's got salt and then we're going to fry them. So you're starting this off but this is what Elliot's making as well so we can yes. see, see what the base is anyway. Oh, so this isn't even going to be used? Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> How, how about how many watch would, would that be? What yeah, you need? That's you need it all. perfect. You've, that's got, you've perfect. got a lot of crew to feed. You see. So you have to show it to people. This how is how you do, do it. it. This, this is, is how you do it. And now would you like to dice some tomatoes? You're not going to yes, use. Yes, so I'm yes. going <laughs> to. I will be using them. Oh, you'll be using these. Yes. Okay. Thanks for that. Yes. Right. So what goes in the the aubergines that you're not going to use that that Elliot's job? Some turmeric, yeah. some salt, and a little bit of um, oil as well. So that oil will be cooked with the. What happens right. then? It, you know, the aubergines can go really black yeah. very quickly. So salt and turmeric helps with that. Right. I'm looking. I'm looking at these nice girls. You're, you're, it's, it's all right, this chef. Brilliant. Well, I told you, I don't mess about four years. It's all right, chef. It's all right. So while we're doing, I'm doing two dishes from the book. Okay. This is hark. Hark is like spinach. They in Kashmir they will use collard greens. Yeah. So instead of collard greens, if you can't find it, you can use the big spinach as well. You know the longer spinach, you can use that. But I'm just using this baby spinach. So all goes into it. Now, as soon as you mentioned the book six times in the last <laughs> 90 seconds... <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to... Shall we show what, it? What book? <laughs> what book, yes. <laughs> this one. What, what is it about? It, it's my travel log. It's a journey from Kashmir to Ladakh. Right. So it's all the recipes are for the people who gave me, they opened their doors to me and told me their stories. So it's a beautiful, beautiful book. I mean, it looks absolutely beautiful. Anyway, doesn't it? The, the, the areas look spectacular. As colourful as the food. It's beautiful. I mean, that's the proper rogan josh in there. That's the, not the rogan josh that you get in this country. That's oh, the dude, proper we've been doing rogan. it wrong. Very wrong. Stupid country. <laughs> <laughs> Do it properly. Stop stealing. You can't have a national dish. <laughs> Do it properly. <laughs> so what do you make? There's five done. Bang. Very good. So this is done. This is what we're looking for. So you're going to brown your aubergines Elliot, Elliot, and take them out. Yet, just me. Oh, you're, you're, so <laughs> and now we're going to put a little bit of more oil, yeah. a very tiny bit. Use Remember the same the pan. Yeah. Yes. Otherwise you'd die. Um, you'd be <laughs> ill. Yes. <laughs> and then you have cumin seeds. We're going to add some cumin seeds right. and some aspartida. Have you tasted that? Uh, that? Have you tasted that stuff? No, just like that. Yeah, it's, quite, it's quite unusual to taste. Don't don't eat, eat it like that. Eating food is better. So some Kashmiri. That's quite weird, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so like when you when you don't fully swallow a paracetamol. <laughs> but... <laughs> With a bit of lemon and a bit of yeah. But it's weird. Right, what's going in there now? Some Kashmiri chili. So you're going to cough a bit. Right. So the tomatoes, your tomatoes, are going to go in here. Expertly diced. The chilli that you put in there is quite pungent. The reason for that is we've got Sam, who works in Autocube upstairs. Go on, cough! <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's, it's quite strong. Yes. It is, but uh, it, it's not overpoweringly hot. It gives you the warmth of the flavour, but it's not really, really hot. So now those aubergines are going to go in here as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't do that again. <laughs> why do you keep on? Why do you keep on doing this? Right. Eating on the spices. Glass of milk. Please. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. And that's not supposed to be hot chili. No, it's all right. It's quite a mesquite sort of. It, it's almost like a barbecuey sort of. So chili. It, it gives you the beautiful colour. So I want to show you. I don't. Can I? Oh, everybody's coughing now. <laughs> <laughs> so this chili. Yeah. If I have some water, I'll take some water. I'll yeah. show you. How beautiful the colour is. So if you add water to it, and yeah. that gives you the colour, look. Yeah. That is how it should. They'd make the paste like it's that. Beautiful. Look at that. Don't eat it, please. Don't, Don't it. be offended by this, but it does actually remind me of like a, a slightly Mexican sort of Tex-Mex sort of yeah. thing. You know what I mean? It's got, it's got, it's got, yeah. it's got a slight sort of barbecue in yeah. to it. So the aubergine goes in there. Right. So we're going to have some asphodida in there and some turmeric. You're going to make a single sack. Can we just all do it in union? Because you're all coughing at different times. One, two, three, now. <laughs> <laughs> just get it out of the way. Get it Shut out of the done. We're done now. Be quiet now for at least two minutes Show while we finish this. I am so sorry. <laughs> Please don't say that we can't have Romy back again because she makes us cough. <laughs> that, that, tell you what, it smells amazing, though. So, 
in the Kashmiri food yeah. and, the, and, and food in Ladakh is all very broth based. It's not like the Punjabi curries, which you're used to it, yes. like heavy, creamy based. Yeah. It's yeah. very subtle and it's not overpowering with garam masala or anything like that. They use whole spices. It's healthy, obviously. Very, very I'll let you put that there. So give us the name of these two dishes then. So this is tomato re vegan, aubergines cooked in tomatoes, yeah. and this is just plain spinach. Romy Gill, everybody! <laughs> Go for it then, all right? Dive right. in. Which one? I'll, try, I'll taste a little bit of this mm. one first. Have some rice as well. Do you there. know what? The spinach, it so, looks so simple. Mm. It's so good. It's just magic. Oh, my God. You worked hard on it. You've done the tomatoes and the green cheese. They can really taste the choppedness of the tomatoes. Yes. <laughs> that is unbelievable. With the rice. It, just try with the rice. It'll and you cook so, so quick. Quickly as well. I'll be honest, I, I've not ever, ever tasted that, so, that on my palate before. So, I wanted to show, if you can't find those aubergines, the aubergines that you get in supermarkets, um, you can just use those and just, you know, make sure the... The bigger aubergines have a lot of water, so make sure you're chunkier, like chunky chips. Make yeah. sure that size. This is the simple, that, this that is warm. Is so easy. But so look. earthy, so warm and nice, simple. And works really well with <laughs> just with... <laughs> it's unbelievable, wasn't it's it? Good, isn't it? <laughs> it's good, isn't it? It's good, isn't it? It's really good. Perfect, that will let you dive in. Romy Gill, everybody! <laughs> right, we've still got time for one more final course, then join me again after the break. We'll be cooking for Elliot. We'll be cooking into a show stopping chicken recipe. I'll see you in a bit. I'm gonna have more Ooh, of this. It's lovely though. It's unbelievable. Thank you. It is unbelievable, this. <laughs> Welcome back to the last part of the show. Now I'm back in the kitchen with the fabulous example! Yay! Elliot, I know who I was, but there you go. And also we've got Romy Gill here as well, and my assistant, yes. my commie. Now, uh, I thought we'd do you a little Moroccan, spatch cooked Moroccan chicken with tabbouleh, if that's all right. Is that all right? Yeah, that's good, yeah. That's all right. Um, and so we've got this nice bit of chicken, we're going to spatch cook it. Really, really simple to spatch cook. First thing we do is just take the little top ends of the legs off, really, for this one. So. The easiest way to do this, really, is to use a pair of scissors. So, to spatchcock it, really simple. Turn it the other way around, and you've got the neck end, neck end and the back end. Uh, and what you want to do is take this sort of half-inch piece out of here. And the best way to do that is using a pair of scissors. So, cut through, and you need some proper scissors for this. Now, you know when you've gone easily through there, it's the, this bit. This is, the, this is the tricky bit. Once you get to this bit, just press it through, and you're through. That's that. Same thing with this side, same again, cut through, and you're just taking out that centre bit. That's the tricky bit once you get to that bit, and you cut it through. Remove that, get rid of that, and then turn it over, open it out, press it down, spatchcock. Done. But you live in Oz, you must be... This, this, is, this is home from home, isn't it? Doing this I on the back of I used to use a sharp knife, but I, thought, I didn't think scissors were very chef-y, but now I know I can use scissors. pair of scissors. <laughs> and then, then we take a, a knife, <laughs> you cut through, all the way through. Sorry, I'm going to put you to use in a minute, yeah. really. So, yeah, you sat there just poised as well, waiting. And we're just going to then cut this through, and then this is going to sit on our tray, and then I'm going to simply roast this with some spices and bits and pieces. So we'll leave that to one side. I'll wash my knife as well. So we're talking earlier about your, your eighth album. Eighth album now. Uh, tell us about it. Those people are just waking up, having been raving and out and about. Yeah, the they'll system. probably still be in bed. Exactly. So, so tell, uh, us, tell us about this one, then. It's uh, my eighth album. It's a mix of drum and bass, UK garage and house. And it's uh, called We May Grow Old, We Never Grow Up. Um, about this is basically a Peter Pan sort of ethos of uh, wanting to just never grow old, really, because I suppose. Is it now because, dare I say, you reached that? Well, I didn't know I'd still be doing this at 40. <laughs> like, you know. Hey, I didn't, I'm 50 and I didn't think I'd be doing this at 50, to be yeah, honest no, with you. But, yeah, but I don't think it's an age to cook in. I think maybe when I started, the, first of all, there wasn't even anyone really who was a UK rapper, even though I make, you know, I dance, I dance music and I rap and I sing. But as a teenager, there wasn't many sort of idols in the UK to follow, you know, there was like, then we had like Mike Skinner and Dizzy Rascal. But I think now the genres are so blurred because back in the day you, you would make, you know, buy a CD or an LP and you'd hear all grunge music or all rock music. Or, what are you, or... grunge or drum and bass? Eric, you're a drum and bass. No, I like 50 cents. <laughs> 
fair enough. <laughs> yeah. I just, oh, man, that's just come out of the middle of nowhere. Go on, then. I like Eminem and 50 Cent. They're my favourite. That's how I grew okay. up listening to them, and I, I love them. Fantastic. Yeah. Do, do, do you, do you, is, it, is it a light that switches on about one o'clock in the morning? It just switches on. You can, you know, in the kitchen, you're dancing, you can see around. Mm -hmm. You know, it's great. I, I think like with it. the advent of uh, uh, digital, you know, streaming, because everything is driven around playlists, you can pretty much make any genre you want and no this one okay? really questions it because you don't... You know, people aren't sat there with CDs in the car. You know, back in the day, you'd have a CD or cassette in the car and that's pretty much all you listen to for six months because the CD stayed in the car. Because of playlists now on Spotify and so on, yeah. there's no rules. So I think because of that, artists feel like they could have the freedom to make whatever genre they want and no one's going to question it as long as it's a good song. Right, you've done some amazing ones. We'll talk about those in a second. But you got this is a, a bit of Rasanut, which is this amazing sort of uh, well fragrant spice, spice yeah. with uh, rose petals and that yeah. kind of stuff in there. It's amazing. A uh, little bit of diced tomatoes, some olive oil. That sort of goes in. You can take a little bit. of... The idea is take a little bit of maple syrup towards the end. Um, is maple rose... syrup big in Morocco? <laughs> No, it is here. It is here. Uh, that's going to go in. It's an adaption, all right? All right. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit like you're rapping. It's an adaption. Yeah, yeah. Right. Make it up to go along. So, yeah, and exactly. We're just going to take this maple syrup, but this over the top of the roasted chicken. It goes in the oven for about 45 minutes, but look. And the maple syrup sits there with the lemon and everything else. See, how good does that look? All right. Yeah. And then we're just gonna... okay? You can yeah, use, can you can use honey, there. I guess. You can use honey if you want, but I've got maple syrup. All right. All right. So that's going to go in there. Because you ran out of honey last night. Well, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That goes in here. And then I want you to do the same with the... We've got pistachio nuts oh, wow. in there. And we've got some uh, pine nuts going in, going in there as well. But I mentioned to your festivals, and I mentioned how perfect you are at doing these festivals. Next year is going to be big for you because you know, you're, you're, you're touring not just, not just uh, in Australia, but globally. You, you spend yeah. an awful lot of time on the road. You, yeah, I mean, like, you're still going to be doing more of that? I think this year I did, I've done what, 60 gigs. I don't need to do a year when I do 128 gigs again. My legs won't. My legs won't last anyway. <laughs> Can me and James come and cook as well? Uh, I thought you were just going after tickets, but if you want to well, cook, I was yeah. just, we just, we could, we, you could just rave in the background. You see, you know that kind of stuff. Just bring a little portable stove. Yeah. And, exactly. Uh, and then we'll we'll boil some noodles in the kettle. But you're what? saying earlier today that that, 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 that how it's different around the rest of the world. You know, you, you're used to going out at certain times. The timing is so different. I can't believe you're saying in parts of Europe. That, that you, you're on at sort of, well, 2 a.m.? Really, really early dust, but yeah. that you start at sort of 2 a.m. Well, I, I had a weekend the other week where we did four flights, uh, 17 hours of driving and five gigs in three days. And I couldn't walk or talk by the Monday morning. This was Friday to Sunday. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, called, I had lunch with my live agent the other day, and he was obviously like, you know, you must be very happy about this year's gone. I was like, yeah, of course. Like, you know, absolutely smashed it for me. It was a load of gigs, a load of amazing slots. But I was like, I don't know if I can do five gigs in a weekend again. Like, I just don't think my legs and my voice can handle it. So it's good to also know your limits. Yeah. Otherwise, you burn out. And I, unfortunately, you know, you end up with those scenarios where poor Amy Winehouse and Avicii... Well, well this is what I want to talk about, really, because we talked about it, touched on it a little bit earlier on uh, this morning. But <laughs> when you were saying about your, your career, you know, your career has been... Difficult in terms of you, you know, you've 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 seen the highs and the lows, but yeah. but also was quite with, with interesting with yourself is a lot of people wait to be signed by a record company. You you almost you did that. You started doing stuff on your own. Yeah, I mean, on your own. there's a lot of acts now who they play their first headline show at Brixton Academy, and it's also their first gig because mm. they've blown up overnight on Spotify. You know, maybe they've got 50 million streams. So everyone's like, yeah, we're sticking one at Brixton Academy. That's 5,000 capacity. You can't. You know, to go straight into that, whether you're a guitarist or you're a rapper or you're a DJ, there's no way you can go straight into Brixton Academy, even after, like, 20 gigs and know exactly what to do. Yeah. So not only are they not prepared for fame, they're not prepared for what they might have to deal with in terms of uh, late nights or addiction, and that could be gambling, sex, drugs, alcohol, yeah. all these things that, you know, all human beings go through, but a lot of musicians, unfortunately, have to overcome it in the space of six months rather than mm -hmm. dealing with it you know, between the ages of 16 and 30, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I just don't think anyone ever prepares artists for what they have to go through. And luckily, I've had good people around me, you know, good management, and even, you know, going to meet your accountant and lawyer and having them check in on you. Can you handle this? Are you being overworked? Yeah. Are you getting enough rest? Are you exercising? Are you having days off? You know, are you detoxing? 
I have a massage. And yeah, you... listen to this, crew. Listen to this. Are you having days off massages? Listen, listen. No, but you know what I mean. These are the... That's that's why I'm still here because I, you know, you could I, I can look forward to a drink on a Friday night, and occasionally, if it's a really amazing gig, we'll get absolutely battered afterwards. Yeah, listen to this, crew. <laughs> listen to this. <laughs> Monday, Monday. Don't listen to this. Right. Anyway, moving no, on. But no, but, you know, mon Monday to Thursday is like rest and recuperation and yeah. looking after yourself and. No, Checking yeah. it, make sure you're all right. Elliot, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. So I thought I'd what I'd do is just you a little main course. <laughs> eat all of that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're not allowed to leave until you eat it all, but you've got this roasted <laughs> chicken. Just to recap, this chicken's been roasted, finished off with a little bit of maple syrup at the end. Uh, you take all the gubbins from the pan as well. The gubbins. We've got a beautiful little tablet that we've made. Yeah. Uh, you've got the toasted nuts in there, the almonds, the pistachio, uh, and the pine nuts in there. With lots of lemon in that. The bulgur wheat, which is this. We don't make it out of couscous. Bulgur wheat, you just soak in water. Yeah. Uh, you leave it for a couple of hours, something like that, but it's perfect. Uh, or overnight. And then we take all the gubbins from the chicken over the top of that mm. to go with it. So and just... Those nuts and pomegranate and the apricot works really well as well because that has the sweetness. You keep, you keep selling yeah. it. You keep selling That's it. Keep, keep going. Keep that has been absolutely yeah. spatchcock. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you keep selling it. So, before we go, give us the name of the album. Uh, we may grow old, but we never grow up. It's out now. It's Ooh. out now as well. But there you have it. <laughs> chicken. Uh, so, it's spatchcock chicken uh, with a nice little bit of tablet. Done. Easy as yeah. that. Yeah. Bon appétit. <laughs> oh. We've got 10 minutes for this one. Yeah, well, at least <laughs> maybe 12 minutes, do you think? 12 yeah. minutes to finish that off? Yes, I don't want to ruin it. It's so pretty. Well, t t yeah, yeah. Dive into, the, dive into this bit here. Oh, this is this. Right. Yeah, taste a bit of that. Thank okay, you. there you go. With everything else. But that, that little bit of maple syrup, you could use honey, of course, but yeah. maple syrup over the top of that. Mm, I made the salad, so I made that. You know, is that any good? It's nice. <laughs> 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 the best bit is... It's nice, though. Mmm. Better than Nando's. Better than Nando's. That's it, you've got... I can keep my job, then. That's yes. the way going forward, anyway. Uh, that's it. That's what we've got time for today. Better than Nando's. <laughs> a massive thank you to my guests, uh, Nick Howell, Paul Rankin, Romy Girl. If I had something, I would throw it at you. Uh, anyway, it's a brilliant example! <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you back here, same time, next Saturday morning, where we're joined by top chef Cyrus Tony Wallet and Daniel Clifford, and social media sensation turned Strictly star Joe Sugg will be here. Until then, take care, stay safe. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye for now. I'm going to the chicken shop. <laughs>